All right, hey everyone, we are about to begin our session, so if you can please take seats and uh, we'll be ready to go in just a moment. All right, welcome back from lunch, everyone. Uh, we are about to begin, so please find your seats. And uh, just a moment, I'll kick it off. All right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the post-lunch event. Please take your seats. We have an exciting agenda. If you are outside, this is the last opportunity to hear the last best presentation for today. Oleg, how's it going, man? Dude, love your work, right? Mycelium? No, what do you work on? A little bit of that, right? I know. Love your blog. All right, cool. So um, after that groupy moment, let's get going. If you have a seat and it feels cold, it requires a warm bottom. So make it happen because even though you're awesome, hey, I mean, dude, I love your Twitter handle, man. I follow you all the time. I just <laughs> it's just all these superstars are here. I'm going to hand over the mic to Jeremy. I just want to say thank you, everybody. You guys rock. Let's do this. All right, we are very, very, very lucky today to have with us Nicholas Negroponte. Now, if you don't know Nicholas, you're probably familiar with many of the projects that he's worked on, such as One Laptop Per Child, Founding the Media Lab, and you may not know this one, but for a, time of pe for a period of time, he was the chairman of DigiCash. So I want hmm, the, the MIT Media Lab. Uh, in contrast to the other Media Lab? I don't know, are there any others that are worth noting? <laughs> uh, it's kind of the one. So please welcome uh, Nicholas Negroponte. Okay. There, it's on. <coughs> okay. Can I shut this laptop just to 
not look over it. Um, well, first of all, I'm very happy to be here for a variety of reasons that will become clear. Uh, I've spent my entire life uh, at MIT and in the world of computing and particularly the sort of idiosyncratic sides of computing. I went to MIT in 1961 to study architecture and thought I would walk out five years later as an architect and uh, walked out haven't walked out yet, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm still there. <laughs> and it was a wonderful place to be. When I was a freshman, Norbert Wiener was still alive and well. And uh, I remember him in the corridors. And what MIT does as an institution is sort of what Bitcoin does uh, for itself, is we're a little bit like Swiss cheese. The, the departments, you know, they're holes in the institution. And a place like the Media Lab couldn't have existed anywhere else. And in fact, there is no knockoff media lab in any other academic institution because they have departments that take themselves seriously as departments. And uh, we are an utterly interdisciplinary or antidisciplinary organization, but we do all the things like hire faculty, award degrees, give tenure, and so on and so forth. Um, so the lab is exactly the right place for something like Bitcoin to be happening, and I'm very glad that in the past six, eight months, uh, it's, it's become a host for pieces of it and will hopefully continue to do so. During my life, I did a number of things uh, outside of MIT. One of them was that I was a founder of Wired Magazine. And to protect my investment, I wrote the back page. Now, probably somebody old enough in the room to have read the back page then because I stopped doing it uh, in the late 90s. But before I became involved with DigiCash, one of the bigger mistakes of my life, uh, I had an experience in Switzerland where I would go because my parents had a home in a ski resort and I would always visit there. In fact, when I went to school, I would go there. So this was a town in Switzerland I knew very well. And as the ski lift modernized, they had RFID tags so that you didn't have to pull your ticket out of your pocket or take your gloves off, which is now probably common in absolutely every ski lift in the world. But at the time, it was relatively innovative. So when you bought your ticket, you had to put a deposit on this small, uh, tiny little card, and the deposit was five Swiss francs. And like me, many of us would forget to bring the little RFID cards. We'd have to buy another one when we got there, and you'd accumulate these RFD, RFID uh, ski lift tickets that all had this five Swiss franc deposit. And I remember having a few in my pocket because I was going to return them. And before I get to the ski lift, I go to a store to buy something, and I pull out of my pocket coins, and there's a couple of these RFID cards. And the person says, oh, no, no, don't. I'll just take those. And the person took the ski lift tickets as five Swiss francs each one of them. And I thought, that's interesting. The ski lift com company is unwittingly creating a currency. And I went and asked other people. And yes, they all had little piles of these RFID cards at home. And it was like a backup parallel currency, all trivial. And I thought, wow. When these physical things now are issued, if you will, by the ski lift company, maybe you can do this with bits instead of atoms. And I wrote some piece for the back page of uh, Wired magazine to that effect, as if I really knew what I was talking about, but it was lobbying for uh, digital currency. And David Chaum read it, I guess, or got in touch with me and was starting a company. And at the time, I said, OK, I'll I'll finance it, so I joined his board. Um, didn't go very well, and at the end, um, as often happens, the founder doesn't survive, the company actually doesn't survive, and some sucker board member is asked to become chairman, and that was me, and, and sort of I watched it go into chapter 11 and chapter 7, and I thought I'd, it would never come back in my life that I would you know, I said, okay, that was a mistake, didn't work out, and now sort of 20 years later, uh, it comes back to, uh, to the Media Lab, and I'm very glad uh, it has. 
Again, in the personal department, I spent five weeks this summer in Greece, because I have a home there, I am Greek 100%, and I spent the five weeks in Greece when there were no banks. Uh, the, the banks of Greek closed. Now, I happen to hate banks. I think banks uh, are at the edge of criminal in their behavior towards their customers. They don't give you much value. They screw you at almost every turn. They charge you for something they shouldn't be charging you. And then they have lots of people who have gone to charm school to you know, have you feel good when you go and do all the work at the teller machine yourself instead of the bank. So I didn't expect to miss banks. But boy, try living for five weeks in a place where there's no bank. And you couldn't pay anybody, nobody could get paid. And finally at the end, I was shipping cash to Greece in every possible mechanism. And at the end, you have to pay salaries. You know, I mean, I actually have a house with people and bills and all of that. And you have to pay at the end of the month some of the salaries, and which usually were done with bank transfers, and just counting it counting up these piles of cash and, and delivering them was, was again, uh, just on a personal level, uh, something that you know, I think, wow, if we could just get rid of cash, if we could really just do things uh, really simply cashlessly. And then last, uh, uh, by way of, of, again, just a personal experience, uh, which is on the other side of the equation, about two years ago, I was the victim of cybercrime. Somebody actually stole a significant amount of money out of my uh, checking account. Now, the reason it happened is, is kind of interesting because I, I, you know, obviously spent a lot of time sort of trying to figure out how it happened, but also sort of trying to cope with it at the time. What happened is the following. The Nobody hacked the bank. The, the bank isn't, wasn't sort of hacked. What was hacked was my email. And somebody got into my Gmail account. I thought I had a good password, but they got into my Gmail account and sat there <clears throat> for what could have been two or three weeks and observed that I had with my assistant a protocol where I'd say, please transfer so-and-so, you know, such and such amount from this account. And and he would make the transfer. There'd be kind of, you know, do you want it from this account to that account, but no formal protocol to sort of really authenticate that it was me sending him the mail, because of course it was me sending the, him the mail. So what these people figured out is they could pretend they were me from within my account, send the assistant a request to make a transfer to a perfectly reasonable name, not. And, and an account, an account in Florida to somebody that has some, you know, usual, normal, Christian-sounding name. It wasn't, a, you know, a complex bank in Nigeria with a, you know, a Russian name or anything that you would make you, so that's not a friend of Nicholas's. But they figured out names that were totally plausible and transferred, made a couple of transfers for $30,000 that worked. And so they said, aha, because they couldn't get into my account. They couldn't figure out how much was in the account. And they said, well, if it works for that much, then the next day they tried two more that also worked because I happened, it was around October 10th, October, around October 10th, 15th, I had moved money into my checking account to pay my taxes. So I had uh, a large amount and almost all of it disappeared. Now, it didn't help, but my older brother, was your first uh, sort of head of national security. He was the first director uh, under the Bush administration. Uh, he came in and was the head as a consequence of CIA, FBI, NSA, all these people. So the first call I make is to him. And I say, John, what am I gonna do? And he says, don't worry, they'll call you. So a few minutes later, some deputy director of cybercrime of FBI calls me and I say, God, I'm in good hands. It's like the director of the hospital calling you up when you're going in for surgery. Did no good whatsoever. Uh, it not only did no good, we had the name of every person who had received these, there were four chunks of money, we had them on video camera going to the bank and taking it out and handing it to somebody else. We had all the names, and guess what? They are considered victims. 
So the laws protect them, and we couldn't go after them. We could, uh, very, so I said, wow, this is a really bizarre system. That first of all, you know, you can get hacked, but also you can't do that much about it uh, because they're all, you know, the, the people who are the so called mules are the victims. So this is a long way of saying that, you know, after a lifetime of, of doing and being involved with these things, I cannot think of too many things that are more important than Bitcoin. And don't blow it, okay? <laughs> don't screw it up, okay? Now, here's how you're gonna screw it up, okay? <laughs> you're gonna screw it up because there are gonna be a lot of people who think that this is a get-rich scam. You're gonna start companies that you wanna see the valuation go up, you're gonna sit on bitcoins because you were the first people to get there. Well, try and park that instinct and try and think differently. And that's sort of my main point this morning. Because I think, I guess it's afternoon, this afternoon. Because I think a lot of things are going in your direction and I'll talk about them afterwards. But the one that I am today most, and I spend a lot of time in it, is what is the difference between a mission and a market. And when you go to sleep tonight, ask yourself, are you on a mission or are you after a market? And if you're after a market, be my guest that a lot of startups do that. But what's gonna make Bitcoin work is when you think of it as a mission. And the mission is a global one. It's gonna make the world a better place and it's gonna make the world a better place in many different ways. You probably know them better than I do. But when a venture capitalist comes and offers to fund your startup, startup and tells you, you know, become cash flow positive, you know, screw them. That's not what you really need to do. I would urge all of you to do nonprofits, not profits. Because I think civic society has been given a pretty, you know, it's got shortchanged, if you will. I have been in meetings, I can't tell you how many meetings, where people sit around the table, and this is in the past couple of years uh, particularly, and say things like, there are two kinds of people in this world, entrepreneurs and philanthropists. And the entrepreneurs, you can be an entrepreneur by working for a company, you don't have to be a startup, but you know, they're, they, and then they're philanthropists and people that, that do humanitarian things. They say, wow, you've forgotten that there's a third segment in society who aren't entrepreneurs and they're not philanthropists. They're civil servants. And our world revolves around civil servants. And we absolutely never recommend to our children to become civil servants. In fact, civic society is just not given much attention. And I'll give you the, the a area which I won't try and talk about currency, but I will talk about connectivity because that's something I know s about these days. Connectivity to the internet not only should be free, it should be provided by civic society. It is not to be provided as a commercial interest, which is the way it's evolved. And when people say, look at the connectivity of the world and look how great it's doing and how many people have phones and so on and so forth, yeah, that's true, but it got there because telecommunications, particularly telephony, was like tobacco and alcohol. If you consumed it, especially long distance phone calls, you could afford it and could be charged userously to help subsidize the rest of the system. And when you look out your house today, if you look out where, whether you live in the city or you live in the country, there are roads, sidewalks, and there are not very few toll roads. People say, yes, there are toll roads. Come on, something like 0.00001% of roads are toll roads. The other roads are there as part of civic society. They're part of the infrastructure and so on. And when you walk out of your house and you walk down a sidewalk, it's a sidewalk that rich people walk down, poor people walk, you know, and so on. Now, when you build the roads, the people who build them, 
bid on contracts, they make money as builders, people plow the roads, they make money plowing the roads, they maintain the roads. So it's not that there isn't an economic system and, and even a pretty good capitalistic economic system, but the roads as part are part of a social infrastructure and a contract we have, if you, if you will, with ourselves as a, as a civil society. Currency should be the same thing. All sorts of, I, obviously education should be the same thing. Most people would put education in that category. In fact, I'd go so far to say that the worst thing that's ever happened to public education in the United States is private education. It just sucks out of the system the people who actually really might care and make a difference. Uh, it does all sorts of things. And if you look at education systems around the world and you look at who has the best ones, almost always uh, each year Finland is off the charts and Finland has, guess what, no private schools, zero. Um, so yet there are a lot of things that you might want to rethink. And when I talk about telecommunications being part of civic society, um, people say, oh, well, you don't mean it's going to be run by the government. Well, what's wrong with being run by the government? There's this de facto assumption that the government can't run anything. Well, if you think the government can't run anything, go to Switzerland and ride a train, okay? The Shinkansen in Japan, apparently all the trains combined last year had a sum total of lateness of 18 seconds. Okay, so there are certain things that governments can run, okay? And it's not just that government is absolutely, now I'm being a bit extreme because I have my troubles as you do too, we all do with bureaucracies and inefficiencies and if you didn't just go to Greece. But it's still not an assumption I wanna make about the future, which gets me to, to uh, my last topic, which is why I think Bitcoin so important from a global point of view, and, and I'll end uh, on this point. Um, I believe that if we sat down this afternoon and it were our mission to redesign the world in some taxonomy that made sense, that what, what is the, how could we organize the world? The last thing we would come up with is countries. And if you think of the current structure of the world composed of somewhere between 190 and 200 countries, depending how you count, um, that's a pretty silly way to divide the world, especially when the smallest one is 1,000 people and the biggest one is 1.2 billion people. It's really a taxonomy that is worse than an accident. It's just happened in funny ways. Sometimes it's arbitrary, sometimes it's cultural, sometimes it's a river that created the border, sometimes all sorts of things. And then in the old days when mobility was, was difficult, you could have one language on one side of the mountain and another language on the other side of the mountain. And then you could find places like Europe that had all these little sort of the texture of the coastline lent itself to, to sort of short boat trips and sort of merchants doing that and then you had other things you go to the Middle East today and you find these arbitrary cuts that were made, uh, usually by the British, but also others were involved. Um, and you say, wow, this is really a crazy, really a crazy, crazy organization of the world. Countries are too big to be local and too small to be global in almost every single case. And the, the taxonomy is nuts. So what do we see? If you look over the past 50 years, I used to know the numbers by heart, but each year we get a few more countries. Uh, they sort of get out, you, sort of, you might see Catalonia next and Scotland next, and you'll, you know, you, you'll be added in you know, drips and dribbles. So, so the number will keep going up, but it's, it's not gonna, you know, yes, when the Soviet Union broke up, broom, there were all of a sudden a lot. When Yugoslavia broke up, broom, there were a lot that got added. Maybe China will break up and India will break up and you'll get another, you know, 80 countries between them and maybe the United States will break up and so on and so forth. Um, maybe to break up in red and blue at the rate we're going and you can let Donald Trump head one of it and you can let uh, whoever, Hillary Clinton run the other. Um, you know, you can pick which one you want to be in. My point is, is that even though there's a natural growing of that, the part that isn't happening 
is the global governance. The UN is at the moment an opportunity cost. And there's got to be some way to organize ourselves. Now, what you're doing, which is sort of the magic of, of what you're, is that there isn't a central organization, organizing element. And that's why it's so important. And it's absolutely critical to get this across to a pretty wide audience. Yes, you've got to be doing what you're doing. And thank you for having this meeting. And, and uh, if we were at all part of it to help ha make it happen, I'm very proud of that. But you also have to get people out there to take this more seriously. And when there are fluctuations and there are people sitting on you know, big chunks of uh, Bitcoin or when, they're, when there's you know, stories in the news, every step, you know, 10 steps forward, or one step forward, 10 steps back, whatever the expression is. So this really needs to be uh, a great effort. And insofar as the Media Lab can help make it a, a, a plausible global currency or money, and you can tell me the differences later, um, I think that would be a great thing and good for you for doing it. Thank you. And I'm willing to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. That was really, really fantastic. Uh, do, did anyone want to ask Nicholas any questions? We can pass Mike. You can also ask me unrelated questions, too. I'm not, <laughs> don't have to stick to. They might want you to use the mic for the tape, not for your voice, but for everyone. Thank you. Uh, so I really enjoyed your talk. Um, you, you must realize that the, uh, fair percentage of the people here are fairly libertarian in their views. So uh, it was interesting to, to, to hear you talk about the roads and to say, for example, that there's nothing wrong with government. Um, so I guess the question here is, what do you see as the role of government in these uh, new currency initiatives? What do you foresee happening uh, as governments come in, regulations come in, and uh, how do you see the space evolving as uh, sort of the more, uh, the big money crowd moves into it? Well, <clears throat> if, it's, if it's not clear, I'm about as socialist as you can get. I come from a, an era and a part of the world where socialism was viewed as good. And if you follow any of these charts and lists as who's the most productive country, who's the richest country, who's the happiest country, you've seen these lists, um, usually the top, eight out of the 10 at the top are socialist countries, um, which is also very interesting. So I see a lot of role for government, but a lot of role for government in the sense of, of doing things on your behalf, less about the re regulatory side. Um, maybe there are ways of coming up with consensus that are different. Maybe there's some lessons to be learned from you. But um, I'm much more for, uh, you know, paying large taxes and having large chunks of life taken care of, whether it's primary medicine, as a human right, as a civic responsibility. I don't believe that you've got to pay for everything directly. What you've got to do is think of a bigger cycle, something where you raise everybody together and then that becomes more contributive to society. And then guess what? Yes, they pay taxes. And yes, that's what gets the system going. Um, no, not each person runs their own police force and other stuff. So, Yes, we should maybe. Do you have a second mic that we can be queuing up? No, OK. Yeah, no, hey, Nicholas, thanks again for what you're talking about. You know, I, I think that uh, a lot of us got both a, a big chuckle and a sense of responsibility when you said, don't screw it up. Uh, can you maybe uh, give us a little bit of color in your mind of what a system in the future that's not screwed up looks like versus one that is screwed up? Well, I think, you know, what, what, what screwing it up is, is that you become digicash. <laughs> okay, you disappear. Um, and uh, 
or you become so de minimis that it's, you know, it was a blip in history and people will remember and you'll, you'll be a chapter in a book. Uh, so I think wide adoption is a piece of evidence of not screwing it up. Um, a way where people see this as the ultimate of fairness and a way of doing things that w weren't done before, that you couldn't get done, that, you know, if it's interests, self-interest, uh, are parked at the door and people who have those self-interests suddenly have to, they're on the same level. So one of the symptoms is if you have your own self-interests, that's going to get you into trouble. Um, it's going to get you into deep trouble. Uh, I don't know if the technology will. I don't. I'm going to have to believe cause that it won't, that, that w wherever there's a technical problem to be solved, it will be and can be. And I just, that's just my nature. I guess that has to do with why I've been at MIT for 54 years is because I believe in that sort of stuff. So it's, it's, it's always the people. You know, and uh, it's it's w and it's funny because it's uh, hard sometimes to predict, because I've been involved with startups, and even though I think startups today have gone way far to the other direction and are providing an enormous brain drain to to the world, that some of the smartest kids are being sucked out of society to do these stupid apps on some iPad with their girlfriend and boyfriend and people but people are not working on big hard problems much less you probably have more people in this room working on big hard problems than I normally get to see and I think that's fantastic but you've got you know that that take one of these starts I've been involved with many I, I funded about 60 uh, personally or as a general partner um, and whenever the company screws up, there's a funny thing that happens, almost always. It's a board of directors, usually, um, even for the private companies that haven't gone public yet, but they've got VC money and they're five or six people uh, sitting around the table. And it's always the case. There's an alpha dog at the table and there's somebody who takes up almost all the airtime at every board meeting and is talking and talking. And then the co company gets into deep shit and is in trouble. And that's the first person to disappear. And there's a one or two quiet people at the table who haven't been sucking up all the air and taking all the attention, who roll up their sleeves and very often help pull the company out of doo-doo and it goes forward. So it's very interesting, the personalities of people. And if you do create a company uh, and if you do have a board of directors, you've got to ask yourself, what is that board going to be like? when everything goes wrong. When everything goes wrong, are they going to be there to help me and roll up their sleeves? And, and I, I know people who have gone into companies at 10 p.m. and walked out you know, at 3 p.m. the following day and uh, have just worked night and day to help. And, and then there's some of these loudmouth people who, who just disappear as soon as the time gets tough. So it's all about, it's, it's just uh, screwing it up as the people. I don't think it's the technology. Thank you. So I probably should give you back your time and your agenda, but thank you very yeah, much thank for you. inviting me. Big round of applause for Nicholas Negerbonte, everyone. All right, so we are about to switch gears and go into roundtable discussion mode. We've changed things up a little bit differently than uh, yesterday. We've, to help with the noise, which is a little bit of the problem, we have two of the discussion groups over here. Uh, just so you don't have to walk around to see which ones they are. We have payment channels and we have uh, communicating without official structures over in these two corners. The rest are in the back. So if you can just go quickly uh, find a seat and then hop right into discussion, that would be great. Uh, try and balance out between the groups. Uh, we want to see a good number of people in all of them. They're very important topics. <laughs> 